Uh, today we are in Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through two, one and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I want to look today at a father's sacrifice. Let's pray. God, it is such a joy to be here uh, in your house and to hear your word today. God, we pray that's exactly what we hear. Uh, not a, a word of a man, but a word from the living God uh, who wants to speak to us, who wants to encourage us, who wants to challenge us, and to help us shape us more into the image of his son, Jesus. Help us this day uh, to grow in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pro-life uh, legacy is a powerful thing to inherit. For Father Thomas Vanderwood, pastor at Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Gainesville, Virginia, that legacy is ingrained deeply in his life and his ministry to, for very personal reasons. Vanderwood's father, Thomas Sr., Prove that every life is precious, amen? Regardless of how the world perceives it. Thomas Sr. and his wife, Mary Ellen, devout Catholics, had seven children. By the time they were expecting their seventh, the couple was in their 40s. The chance of birth defects was high. Josie was born with Down syndrome. Chris Vanderwood, one of, his, one of the sons, says, it didn't matter that Joseph had Down syndrome. He, he was my father's son. And that was all the reason my father needed to love him. Thomas Sr. demonstrated that, lo that love in 2008. One morning, Thomas Sr. and Josie were in the yard when Josie fell into a broken septic tank, which at eight feet deep was terribly dangerous. Thomas Sr. tried to grab his son, but it was fruitless. Immediately, he lowered himself into the tank. And because he couldn't keep Josie's head above the water line, decided to hold his breath, dive under, and hoist Josie onto his shoulders to keep him breathing. By the time the rescuers arrived, Thomas Sr. had died, saving the, the life of his son. This story of a father giving his life for a son that the majority a parents would have aborted and impacts Reverend Thomas Vanderwood in, a power, in powerful ways. Today he carries on his father's legacy by building his ministry on pro-life truths. At one point he catalyzed an outpouring of love for a young couple expecting a baby with Down syndrome. Several of these families offered to adopt the baby, which miraculously the couple agreed to. And Thomas, inherited, and his inheritance of love, uh, gives on to each child. Today's uh, text, uh, you may be, uh, after reading this illustration, you might be thinking, Jason, did you read the text? It's not about a father sacrificing himself, but sacrificing his son. I did read it, by the way. Uh, this account uh, of Abraham on the sacred mount, uh, and I would say the, the sacrificial mount, the sacrificial mount, uh, this is one where I, I'll, I will say, I see a sacrifice from the father. Being a father, <laughs> I can see how much of a sacrifice that would be uh, to bring your son, your only son as God describes it. He had Ishmael, but this is the only son of promise, uh, the one he loved. What a sacrifice that would be to put him on the altar and, and raise the knife. Uh, but I believe Abraham's sacrifice is one that really took place before going to the mount. Uh, I believe it was, God was working on his heart well ahead of time, uh, getting him to let go of Isaac, to stop surrounding your whole entire life around the promised child, uh, but on the one who grants, the ch grants children. Uh, this sacred sacrifice on this sacred mount, 
that's really what I want fathers especially to focus in today on how the sacrifices we make as fathers, uh, spiritual senses and in a spiritual sense, uh, to love our children so much that we're willing to sacrifice them. In a way, let them go, not literally, uh, but to maybe had to put them on the altar in those times when maybe our hopes, our dreams, our comforts maybe are resting too much on our children uh, and our hopes are not, have, have dwindled away from on, on the creator, the giver of every good gift. This, uh, this story here has caused many people, including Bible scholars, uh, to see God as heartless, cruel, rigid, Maybe even insecure, needing affirmation uh, from his children, from his followers, to tell him uh, how much they will do for him. That he actually, as if he needs, a, needs our worship. But when you look at this story through the eyes of faith, uh, through the discernment that only the Holy Spirit gives for only those that are in Christ, when, when we look at this through the eyes of of faith. He may start with some questions. Why, why would God do this? Why would he call Abraham uh, to sacrifice his son, the God who is all about life, right? may start in questions, but with the eyes of faith, uh, they will be answered with an exclamation mark. may start with a question mark, but it will answer with an exclamation mark. Many have seen, seen the story and looked at, uh, say there's an Old Testament God and there's a New Testament God. No, it's the same God. Those silent years between the Old Testament and New Testament, over 400 some years, that wasn't so God can get counseling and become a nice guy. He's the same God. Uh, when God has us do unusual acts, maybe call us to do things that we just don't understand. We, we feel the Spirit leading us to do something that just doesn't make, make sense to us. How is this going to work out? It's for our good. For his glory, for our good, not so he can hear uh, to see how, how much you're willing to give to him and, and do for him, but so we can see how much, how much we need to give to him, how often we need to make sacrifices uh, that are necessary at times. Uh, this is a God who doesn't give us commands to bind us and restrict us, but to free us to set us free from that thing or that person that we may be trusting in too much to get our source of life from it, where, it, where it overshadows God. Now, there are yokes, right? Jesus said, I have a yoke. And the yoke is easy. My burden is light. He's comparing that to the yoke of sin, what the, the master of sin. Uh, what the, the fruit of that the fruit of the master of sin will lead to heavy, heavy burdens in our, in, in our lives. Uh, just look at every addiction, right? What, what, what that does, what, how great, it might have started out easy, right? And fun. But it led to being in prison, being enchained, uh, restricted. On the opposite side, when God issues commands, it might seem really hard and really narrow. But it leads to what? Everlasting life. Jesus said the way is narrow. It starts really narrow. It's going to be hard to adjust to at first, but once you do, God just gets greater and greater as, he, as you give him more and more of yourself. Um, our God is not one who wants to limit us, but he wants to set us free. His commands are not uh, burdensome, right? Uh, think of it as wings on an airplane, right? They may first you know, add a lot of heavy weight, right? But they enable that airplane to soar, uh, to go to heights where it never could without them. And God will call us to sacrifice something, even if it's inherently good. Maybe it's a ministry. It, you need to stop this, because this is getting too much about the ministry and maybe attention. Maybe uh, something, something good, like Isaac. That was a good gift from God, but it became an idol. So he said, set him free. Uh, set yourself free and set him free as well. Uh, Abraham, with this one act, this one act of obedience, he taught Isaac many lessons, and he teaches us many lessons. 
Uh, I would say one big one, even though, even though I don't understand what God's going on, if God says it, I believe it, and that settles it. God says it, I believe it, that settles it. Uh, whether it's just in his plain word or something that he's calling us to do that might seem kind of crazy at first maybe. Uh, I know God is good, so I believe it, and I trust in his character, and it's going to turn out great. Might not be easy at first, but it'll lead to good. So he, Abraham taught Isaac many lessons here, and us, uh, us fathers and us believers who have people looking up to us, uh, I want to look at five things today uh, that Abraham shows us, and he showed uh, to Isaac, and he taught Isaac on that sacred mount in the region of Moriah. So five fatherly lessons from Moriah. Not Moriah. This is not Moriah Carey. Uh, I'm not Moriah Carey sermon. Moriah. Moriah. All right. First one. God loves us just the way we are, but what loves us too much to let us stay that way. Loves us just the way we are, just as when we first came into the kingdom. Loves us just the way we are. Words and all, right? but loves us too much to allow us to stay that way. The beginning of this chapter and this story and this account is with these words, after these things. Well, what things? If you back up a little bit, namely it's Abraham's dealings with a guy named Abimelech, a king named Abimelech. If you remember, Abimelech, he, uh, he, ha, he saw Sarah and wanted to take her as his wife. Uh, and he was about to, and he has a dream. Now, I don't know if it's like the ghost of Christmas past or present or what it's like. But in that dream, he was shaken. Because God appears to him and says, if you take that woman, not just you, but you and all that belong to you, are as good as dead. God got, got it across to him. You do not go near this woman. You let her go. And why did he have that dream? And why was he about to take her? Because what did Abram do? He lied. He said in fear, uh, he lied and said, this is my, my sister. Uh, and yes, Abimelech gave him an earful. <laughs> Uh, but we see in that, you know, in Abraham and his doubts and his fears, God was gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He didn't just cast them off, right? He stayed with them, uh, remained in the covenant. And uh, even with, with Sarah, remember the story with Sarah whenever Isaac was first born, right? Uh, they waited so long. For that promised child that, like, well, maybe he's not coming. <laughs> maybe God got us confused with somebody else. And uh, so what they do, uh, Sarah says, hey, I got this young handmaid. Uh, she, she can bury a child. He, and he's like, oh, no. No, he said, okay, sure. No problem. Let's do it. And uh, so they doubted God's promise. And God gave birth to, to Ishmael, right? And, uh, of course, that caused domestic strife, but also international strife. That even gets seen today, right? Um, so despite Abraham's doubts, fears, mistrusts, he learned that God loves me just the way I am, but loves me too much to let me stay that way. So he brings him to the mount, to the place of testing so that Abraham will see his need for growth so that he will grow because God is concerned with him. Uh, he says, take your only son. Notice he didn't say anything about Ishmael. He said, take your only son. He had Ishmael, right, to Hagar. And I think yeah, part of that is God saying, yeah, this, this is my plan. Ishmael wasn't part of my plan. We're talking about the one son, Isaac, the one that is, is the child of promise. But I think also he was saying, yeah, you made some poor decisions, but I'm not going to focus on those. We're going to focus. We're going to keep on 
keeping on with what I have planned, and we're going to move forward, because I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, right? Uh, plans to use you for my glory. Uh, every single one of us are in that boat, right? We look at our past, if God would have uh, stopped when we failed, when we feared, when we doubted, we wouldn't be here right now. We would have stopped coming to church long ago. But Abraham's there, and he's getting ready to, to worship, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of worship. Uh, because God didn't throw him out or give up on him. He doesn't dwell on our poor decisions, but he, he moves us forward, uh, giving us opportunity. Uh, the second chance, third chance, fourth chance. If God was a GPS voice, imagine how many times he has to say, turn around, no, uh, wrong direction, turn, turn here. Hey, you idiot. This way, what are you doing? How many times I got to tell you? Huh? The blessing's over here, not over here, right? Uh, Abraham showed Isaac that God remains with us. I'm still going to, even though you made a after all these things, after all these mistakes, I'm still going to use you. Uh, I love you not because of who you are, but despite who you are. And I love you too much to let you stay that way. Uh, that's what Abe, one of the first lessons that Abe showed Isaac on that sacred mount as they go to worship together on that sacred time. Uh, What's interesting is, yeah, you know, when we see God doesn't focus on our sins and weaknesses, but He'll focus on our our strength. What was what was Abraham's strengths? He had strengths, of course. He was the father of what? Father of faith. Yes, father of Isaac. If, you, if anybody said that, yes. But the father of faith, as he's known, God said, "Get up and go," and he got up and went. Then took a lot with him. Uh, it was a lot of work to get up and go. And he just went to a place that he didn't know. God just says, go that way. Promised land's over there, go that way. Go to the land, land of Canaan. Uh, so his great strength was being a man of faith. But his weakness, weakness, we see here, is trusting that God, that, that God he's trusting in so much to move, go where he never went before, but trusting him with his loved ones. For example, Sarah. As we already mentioned, when he lied about her, if he was lying about Sarah that he loved, guys, uh, husbands in the room, you know, your wife's in trouble, you're going to protect her. And you're going to see something come out of you that you never thought you would. Uh, but imagine how much more for your child. How much more if, if, if Sarah caused him, his love for Sarah cause him to compromise his faith and trust in God, how much more do you think Isaac would? So he has him go to the mount before it gets really bad uh, and say, you need to sacrifice him uh, to protect you and to protect him and all others around you guys. I don't know about you, I've had emotions arise in me uh, after becoming a father. That's one of my boys is threatened in any way. I don't feel like a Christian inside. Uh, I feel like I'm about to get locked up. Uh, but anyhow, just imagine how, much, how strong that would have been uh, if God allowed Abraham to continue to make it all about Isaac that Sonny waited and waited and waited for for so long. Uh, but he needed liberated from. He needed liberated from Isaac to be willing to sacrifice him on the altar. Uh, and bless Isaac as well. Because imagine if you're Isaac, and God is talking about you. It's all he talks about is, is Isaac, right? What's that going to do to you? Make you entitled even more than you may already are. We don't need any help with being entitled, do we? <laughs> but that was uh, some of the greatest gifts we can give our children is more attention. Other times, the greatest gift we can give our children is less attention. Right? <laughs> So the nice thing about worshiping God, really, I would say, is giving him our attention, giving him our highest attention. And his, attention, his highest attention wasn't on God. It was on Isaac, and he needed to be set free. Number two, lesson number two that Abraham would have passed down to Isaac in this one act, the first yes to God is always the easiest one. 
The first yes to God is always the easiest one. Verse 3, uh, after God's command to Abraham, Abraham doesn't just sit and think about it and pray about it. He said, let's, let's get together. Uh, let's, I'm, hey, Sarah, let's talk about this. I think God wants us to sacrifice Isaac. No. It says, early the next morning, the very, as soon as he could, he loaded up that donkey and started towards the altar. Because he knew delayed obedience, right? Delayed obedience is really what? Disobedience. Putting it off is disobeying God. As long as you're putting off delayed obedience is disobedience. But that first yes to God is always the easiest. He probably knew that if I don't say yes now, I don't think I ever will for how challenging this is. So he did it right away. He knew was, he heard it from God. It wasn't that pizza he ate right before bed. He knew this was the word. This was God speaking. And so he said, I know if I don't do it now, I'm going to be in disobedience. I had a coach uh, in college. I actually don't remember his name. I didn't have him very long, but I remember this phrase. It stuck with me. He says, do it light. I'm sorry. If you do it right, you'll do it light. You do it wrong, you're going to do it long. Imagine how many times we go on these detours that cost us a lot. Detours with God. God said do this a long time ago. And we put it off and put it off, and we have to pay a lot, all this interest to get back. We have, when we go on that detour, we take that long walk, and every step we take is one step further back. We've got to come back, right? So that's why the first yes to God is always the easiest. We're not, we don't get as entrenched uh, if we do it right away. So Abraham showed Isaac. When God speaks, do it. Just do it right away. Because you may never do it if you, don't, if, if, if you wait. It doesn't get easier if you wait. It gets harder. That's why Hebrews says, today. Today, if you hear his voice, don't do what? Don't harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. It'll just get harder and harder, and you start to lose that sensitivity to God and maybe never respond. Uh, that this fa father Abraham shares with Isaac in this moment, don't rest in God's explanations. Rest in his good character. In the moment, I'm sure Abraham was wrestling. He probably wrestled more than Jacob did later. I'm sure he was wrestling that night. He probably, he probably didn't even sleep that night. Uh, having to sacrifice his son on the altar. I, and I'm sure he was tempted to say, why God, right? Uh, but this is the father of faith. Uh, and this is the promised child, right? I mean, imagine taking the promised child. God says, you're going to be blessed like, just look at the sand on the seashore, the st stars in the sky. That's how much your offspring is going to bring. Now sacrifice them. How's that going to work? Um, it's almost like building a boat when you've never seen rain. Uh, here's how he did it. And this is repeated in this chapter. Uh, here's where that, as soon as God says do it, he says, when he says, Abraham, his response is, here I am. And later on when he stops Abraham, he says, Abraham, Abraham, twice. Same response, here I am. You know what that is? Here I am is the response of a servant. It's a servant's response. Like Isaiah, right? Here I am, send me, Right? Or uh, Noah, like I mentioned, building the boats. We've never seen rain. Noah said, here I am. I don't know what this rain stuff is, but, or what a flood is, but you said it. I'm going to do it. Here I am. I'm your servant. Or uh, Samuel, right? Many times God called out to him, uh, and he thought it was who? Eli. And he said, here I am. The servant's response. Your servant is this. Your servant is listening. Once we have the mindset that I'm servant, he's master, we can remove why from our vocabulary. When the master says do it, we just do it. 
We do it because the master said so. Uh, if I don't have the mindset of servant, the only time I'll do it is whenever I feel like it. I'll only do it out of convenience. Uh, and I will miss so much of what God wants to do in my life. Uh, we've got to be careful with that term servant. Oh, he's a servant. She's a servant. I'm, a, I'm just a servant. Are you? Are you serving? Are, when the master says go, do you go? That's what the servant does. No, you don't have an option. You just go, right? Too many, uh, too many of us want to have a faith that sees a mountain move. But not enough faith to see our two feet move. You, see, you, you have the faith of when God says go, you start going, you're going to see a lot of mountains move. Because you're used to just seeing God, as it, when God says go over here, you go and you see, it might take a few years to see it, but you'll see, oh well, wow, God, you really do know what, you, what you're doing. How many testimonies and how many miracles would you have missed if you waited for God to give an explanation first as to why you're doing it? I mean, Abraham, when he... If you were Abraham, would you have needed an explanation to sacrifice your child? But Abraham just got up and like I said, don't rest and trust in God's explanations. Trust in his good character. He's never failed me before. Those that, those that trust in the Lord will never be put to shame. No matter how wild and crazy this thing is that God has called me to do, no matter how scary it may be, uh, in the end, we'll see, yes, God knows exactly what he's doing. And in the past and all the other times, it's turned out so good. Uh, it wasn't easy, but it was good. Uh, and good for me and good for the glory of God. Fourth lesson. Uh, most worship involves sacrifice. Involves some kind of pain. Now, if you were sitting in front of me while we were singing, there might have been some pain to your ears. But uh, this is not the kind of pain we're talking about. Uh, when, when Abraham left his two servants with the donkey and said, hey, we're, me and Isaac, me and my son, we're going over to, uh, to the mountain. You stay here. But what did he say? Uh, we will go do what? Worship. We're going to go over and worship. Uh, you talk about pain in the offering. Worshiping when it hurts. Uh, how much pain would that have been for, for Abraham to lift that knife? Uh, and maybe he would have said, this is, going to hurt you. this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but uh, how much pain it would have been. We know as, as fathers, as as parents, to see your child in the pain, it, it really hurts, right? It really does hurt inside. Uh, but this is a painful offering, a painful, painful worship. And I would say the majority of our worship is not the tingle from singing Amazing Grace, but maybe that twitch from letting it go of our amazing grip or wanting to control it all. I would say the majority of our worship is the pain where like, I don't want to do that and let that thing go, but I let it go, and in that act, that was probably the greatest worship I ever encountered as I just surrendered it to God, right? Some may say it, it's not worship till it hurts. Now, I'm not saying everything, every worship we do, it has to be, uh, we have to endure it more than enjoy it, right? But there's going to be some kind of cost, uh, Maybe it's resisting that sin, uh, fighting that addiction, confronting uh, a fellow believer, staying up late at night to lend someone your ear. And that's usually never any, uh, never appropriate time for that, or I guess an easy time, convenient time to listen to someone that's hurting. Uh, serving the garage sale. Did that, f I mean, was there any pain? Did I get an amen today? Any pain in that offering? Uh, setting up for the garage sale, uh, getting up every day, uh, helping, uh, loading up, or, or people check out, whatever it might be. Pain in the offering. How about you, three days of lifting boxes, 
at the garage sale, you probably worshiped more uh, than a whole year of lifting your voice. The pain in the offering. Uh, this was a painful offering that Abraham and Isaac uh, were about to encounter. Uh, Isaac didn't know it at first. Uh, but let me remind you, he didn't squirm once he did realize it. Uh, so pain in the offering, in this act of worship. I mean, I think there's somewhere in the Bible that says, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, right? Living sacrifices. That doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound painless. Living sacrifices, pleasing to the Lord, for this is your what? Spiritual act of worship. Worship usually is going to hurt. There's going to be some kind of pain, but always rewarding. Always giving me more than I put in. Uh, growing in my knowledge of God and being aware of his presence, even, even closer to his presence. Uh, but like I said, I think, I think Isaac got the message because, like, we didn't, like I said, we didn't see him squirming. He probably learned that from Abraham, not just in this one act, but throughout the years Usually to offer a sacrifice or, or to worship God is to require some pain. And he just, he didn't squirm. He was, Isaac was much stronger than Abraham at this point. But probably about 20 years old, Abe was just frail, right? He could have easily overpowered him and said, no, we're not doing this. But no, he accepted it. Uh, maybe uh, you're here and you need to have that time, uh, that pain of worship through worship. Maybe it's apologizing. Were necessary. Maybe it's swallowing your pride at some, some, some point. Giving to the needy. Confessing your need. Forgiving that brother or sister. Uh, number five is our last one, the last lesson from Abraham. Father Abraham, where God guides, I think we know this, God provides. Where God guides, God provides. It was only when Abe lifted that knife that he saw the provision. That God called out, Abraham, Abraham. Uh, and then, as we know, we saw, he saw a ram caught in the thicket. A substitute for Isaac. A provision God provided. Uh, Hebrews 11 uh, says how Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. Literally. He did it figuratively, right, with Isaac. He never, he never did have to pull the knife down. But he, he reasoned that God could raise it, even if I do slay him. God can raise it from the dead. But what was his reference point? How many people did he see risen from the dead? None. He just trusted God, trusted his good character, and he knew that his God provides. I don't know how it's going to work out, but God's going to provide. And I, I believe he knew this. If we, if we look into the text, when, he, when, when Abraham said to the servants, we're going to go over here and worship, he didn't say, and I'll be back. He said, and we'll be back. I think he really believed. Even if he did it, God was going to save him. He was going to raise him up. Uh, Abraham had a strong faith. Some may call it a blind faith. No, I would call it a further seeing faith. He just can see much further than everybody else, way over the horizon. Some may call it a blind faith. No, you're the one that's blind. You can't see what God's going to do. You, you can't see his provision ahead of this, right? If someone condescendingly says to you, oh, yes, it's blind faith. You're so naive. So no, I could just see much clearer than you can. My God has never failed me. I can see much further. It might not even be until to eternity uh, the reward for this of trusting God and faith. There's rewards for faith, right? God rewards our acts of faith. Um, he's a rewarder of faith. He just, I can just see further. Uh, not a blind faith, but a faith that can, eyes that can see. I can see that God is going to provide. Of course, uh, we can't close this without looking at our Heavenly Father, right? Another father who made a great sacrifice and for the restoration of relationship. Abraham needed that. There was something hindering him between him and God, and maybe even Isaac as well. But a restoration of relationship. Now, that type of offering, it was a burnt offering, and those were given, 
we know of one account before this, Noah, after the flood, right? Uh, he, had, he offered a burnt offering and a, kind of an offering of restoration, right? Things being renewed. Uh, our Heavenly Father, of course, Jesus on another, maybe another mountain. Some say it might have been the very same mountain. But in the same region even is where Golgotha was. The hill of Calvary, where the mountain of Calvary, where Jesus, uh, the far, our Heavenly Father's Son, uh, was slain for our sins, our, the ultimate sacrifice. When we read John 3.16, I think we tend to read John 3.16. We may say it the right way, but we... we th- we think, at least maybe I do, uh, John 3.16, as if Jesus said, uh, for Jesus so loved the world that he came uh, for all those that who would believe and died for all those that who would believe in him. But it doesn't say the Son. What does it say? For God, the Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his Son. That, it was a sacrifice that was a sacrifice. Had our Heavenly Father, not just Jesus sacrificed, our Heavenly Father sacrificed. Put yourself in God's shoes. Put your child on the cross. How much a sacrifice is that going to be? Uh, Jesus, yes, got separated from the Father, but also the Father got separated from the Son. He had to watch his Son get beaten, get spit on. Could you, could you put your son there or maybe your daughter beaten, spit on, wrongly accused, whipped and lashed with leather containing broken glass? Uh, nailed to a cross and separated from him. What pain would that have been? Uh, But that was a true sacrifice, a true sacrifice from the Father, uh, for he so loved us that he gave his son a true sacrifice on the mountain. Remember, like Isaac, Jesus didn't squirm. He accepted it. And he did nothing wrong, right? But he accepted it and uh, proved God's love, he proved his love for us, and uh, with that sacrifice uh, has showed us that he really loves us, right? If he doubted. So fathers, uh, fathers today, and I guess say all of us, uh, may we leave today remembering that sacrifice, and also that model that Abraham gave as an example. Uh, when a time comes, if we need to sacrifice something, do it, uh, for our sake, for our own sanity, for our own sanctity, uh, and for the glory of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this Father's Day. I thank you for all the fathers here that have been awesome examples, not just to their own children, but to uh, other people that have seen their faith and seen their example. So I thank you for all those examples here, not warnings, but examples uh, that have showed us that Uh, To follow you is often to make sacrifices and is so rewarding. Uh, No no one can take away our faith and our relationship with you. God, we thank you that you are a patient God with us. You're gracious and yet you gave uh, your son to save us all. As we go from here, maybe remember how how good a father you are uh, who, who gave his son and went through that pain for us. We pray in Jesus' name.